Our body tells us when something isn't quite right. Like when we place our hand in hot water. Or sense danger while watching a horror movie. Listening to those signals can make a huge difference. Especially when it comes to your vascular system. Peripheral artery disease, PAD for short, is a lot more common than one would think. There are clues that PAD gives our body to let us know if we are suffering with a condition. Like painful leg cramping after common activities, cold legs or feet, sores that won't quite heal, skin color changes, or a decrease in hair growth on your legs. If any of these symptoms are giving your body signals, it could be PAD. Left untreated, the disease can lead to amputation, stroke, and even heart attack. The next step is to ask for help. At St. Luke's, our trusted team of cardiologists and vascular surgeons have extensive experience treating the condition. So, if your body is giving you signals, listen and schedule an appointment today. Hi, my name is Dr. Matthew Bunty, and I'm the co-director of the St. Luke's Hospital Vascular Center and director of vascular medicine at St. Luke's Health System. I'm pleased to have you join us today for a discussion about peripheral artery disease. Today, I'm also joined by my co-director of the Vascular Center, Dr. Karthik Vamanan, who's going to also discuss endovascular and uh, surgical treatment for peripheral artery disease. First, I just wanted to point out that we'll be collecting questions for today's presentation, and I would encourage you to ask those questions in the chat box. Those questions will be answered after this presentation, and then the answers to those questions will be emailed out to everyone after. Let's get started on the knowing your risk, top facts about peripheral artery disease that you should know to help improve your cardiovascular health. Today we'll talk about the basics of peripheral artery disease and the top three facts that I hope to have you take away today and to know about peripheral artery disease. Today we'll discuss PAD treatments that lower cardiovascular risk, which will be the focus of our chat together. Of course, leg pain is a very common problem that every primary care physician and certainly um, I as a cardiovascular medicine specialist see in the office. And uh, many folks recognize that spine problems or sciatica Arthritis of the hips and knees and muscle strains can be common causes of leg pain. Also, commonly associated with diabetes is neuropathy and vein disease certainly causes a lot of problems. But peripheral artery disease, of course, has very important implications that these other diagnoses don't uh, offer or cause. And specifically, uh, PAD is the only cause that I've listed here that would contribute to amputation, the feared risk of peripheral artery disease. So let's talk more about what peripheral artery disease is. PAD is a serious medical condition that affects blood flows to the arms and legs, and it may be the first sign of serious systemic problems. PAD is associated with atherosclerosis, which are fatty deposits that develop in the arteries. These fatty deposits happen over years and are associated with chronic artery inflammation that can be instigated by diabetes or kidney disease or smoking. Um, these Plaques that develop in the arteries not only cause narrowing of the arteries, but also can contribute to clotting in the arteries rarely. And I think it's important to keep in mind that the muscles play a very important role in oxygen consumption and blood flow as we exercise. As you can see from this figure at rest, most of our blood flow is diverted to our bowels and guts, a bit to our kidneys and skin, and the muscles certainly take up some of that blood flow. But when we're active, the muscles take up most of the blood flow. And so you can imagine then, if we have blockages in the arteries, that becomes a problem. So blood flow can adapt to activity level when the blood supply is normal and the oxygen demand from the muscles is normal, everything is in balance. But in peripheral artery disease, that blood supply can't keep up with the oxygen demand and consequently, PAD causes muscle pain. And that muscle pain is typically felt in the legs and lower extremities, but it can be felt in the butts, hips, and thighs as well. But the problem essentially is the blood flow can't keep up with the oxygen demand and the muscle supply. The symptoms of PAD then often are associated with exertional leg pain, cramping, heaviness, and fatigue in the legs, but in its more severe forms can be associated with lower extremity hair loss, coolness, numbness, or skin changes. Non-healing wounds or gangrene of the feet or toes are signs of more advanced peripheral artery disease and require more urgent attention. 
these more advanced patients are at risk for amputation. The risk factors then for PAD include a history of smoking, diabetes, advanced age, high blood pressure, excessive weight, a family history of peripheral artery disease, and high cholesterol. The top three facts that I hope this audience takes away today is knowing that PAD is common. We'll talk about that a bit more. PAD in indicates a greater heart and vascular risk and that thankfully PAD is treatable. So let's talk about that first fact. PAD is common. Many community members don't even realize that their leg pain is associated with PAD. And let's explore why PAD is so common. Well, first, 10 to 12 million U.S. adults have peripheral artery disease. This is more common than patients with stroke or atrial fibrillation, which are much more well known. And put together, the 10 to 12 million U.S. adults is about the same population of Kansas, Missouri, and Arkansas put together to give you a scope of the problem. PAD is strongly linked to other common conditions many patients have, including diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and folks over the age of 60 are at particularly high risk. What is particularly concerning to us who practice in the space of vascular medicine is the burden of PAD is really increasing quickly with an epidemic of diabetes. This is a, a graph from the Centers for Disease Control showing the rise in prevalence or the amount of population with diabetes. And as you can see in 2018, patients over age 65 now have about a one in five chance of having PAD. And many of those patients, including one in three over age 50, also have peripheral artery disease. PAD is more common and more serious in our underserved communities. And that's a particular focus in our health system in improving our community health. We see diabetes drives PAD rates in minority communities. And like diabetes, PAD disproportionately impacts non-white populations. Again, this graph is from the Centers for Disease Control showing that Hispanics in the blue line and non-Hispanic blacks represented in the gray line have a prevalence or a percent of population affected by PAD that's about twice that of the green line, which is uh, the white population. PAD is most common among older adults. After about Medicare age, we really see the rates of PAD increase, so we're particularly vigilant about looking for this condition, but you should be aware too that PAD really does increase with age and is also pretty uncommon under age 50. We anticipate that the rates of PAD will rise with time. This is a, a graph from the U.S. Census Bureau showing that our population is going to increase in age over time and that the percentage of folks over age 65 is really expected to increase uh, quite a lot in the next 20 to 30 years and with that PAD is also expected to increase. Let's talk about our second fact you need to know about PAD. PAD in indicates a greater heart and vascular risk. In fact, I tell patients that with PAD that they're just as likely to have a subsequent heart attack or stroke as patients who have already had those problems. Compared to patients who are of the same age, those with PAD have five times greater heart attack risk and about a three times greater stroke risk, and uh, those are really serious risk factors. And it is not surprising uh, that PAD is associated with that risk because it's essentially the same process of plaque buildup in the arteries it's just that the patients with PAD have that plaque buildup in the legs. But that plaque buildup also is also ongoing in the heart and the, and the vessels that lead to the brain that cause those other risk factors. PAD is associated with a really high cause of uh, mortality or death at five years. And to put it into perspective, I show a graph here that shows the five-year risk of dying with breast cancer or having a heart attack, we also call acute myocardial infarction, or colorectal cancer stroke, you can see that patients with PAD have a higher risk of dying at five years than people who've had a heart attack. And the most severe form of PAD, critical limb ischemia, is nearly as bad as folks who have lung cancer. So this condition is very serious and has a high risk of uh, patients dying from this condition. So the best medicine here is to prevent PAD altogether or catch it early and lower the cardiovascular risk. PAD is also the number one cause of non-traumatic amputations. About 150,000 U.S. adults undergo amputation annually and $4.3 billion of uh, 
cost is diverted to pay, caring for patients with amputations. Many patients undergo amputations unnecessarily and if we can do a better job of identifying patients early and making sure that patients have appropriate vascular testing, we can reduce those risks. And that's just not me talking. Uh, we've got, got uh, much experience and evidence to back that up. Testing and treatment for PAD saves legs. And we know that patients who had amputation often don't get tested. In fact, pre-amputation arterial testing, such as an ankle brachial index we'll talk about in a minute, was not completed in about a third of patients undergoing a leg amputation. In the year prior to amputation, over half of patients had no a, a, attempt at fixing the artery problems in the legs. And the odds of undergoing an amputation reduced by 91% when patients with severe PAD underwent appropriate vascular testing and a diagnostic angiogram. Dr. Vamanan will discuss what an angiogram is a little later. What is also very surprising about amputations associated with PAD is this significant variability across this country. This is a map showing amputation rates where the dark purples are high rates and then the whites and grays are lower rates. And you can see that there are a, there's a wide variety of amputation rates throughout this country. And there's no real good reason for it. I think it's just, unfortunately, some areas of the country have less awareness and ability to treat peripheral artery disease. Fortunately, here in Kansas and Missouri, we're in a, a much better spot than some other parts of the country, but still more can be done. Even in a single community, this is a map of Los Angeles County, there's a lot of variability. And unfortunately, amputations really impact our minority and underserved communities a lot more than um, folks who are in more, from more affluent areas. And so we need to do a better job of providing consistent vascular care throughout our communities. The likelihood of undergoing a major amputation really does depend on where you live, but also uh, where you're from and who you are. And unfortunately in this country, uh, black patients have a likelihood of major amputation that's almost twice as high as other groups, including whites and Hispanics. So there is much more to be done in our community to make sure that where amputation rates are as affecting as few patients as possible, and we're getting our word out to make sure that patients know there are other treatment options. When we talk to patients in the office about peripheral artery disease who are facing amputation, we certainly talk about peripheral artery disease, but we also pay attention to things like their socioeconomic status and are they able to make it to appointments and afford their medications, as well as where they live. Are they close to the hospital or do they live some distance away? We focus on diabetes because it's such an important implicator in needing an amputation, and we also focus on race and ethnicity for the reasons I've mentioned before. The American Heart Association recently released a recommendation statement and challenge to reduce non-traumatic lower extremity amputations by 20% by 2030. In the next 10 years, we hope to help participate in these initiatives and help educate our community and participate in initiatives that lower amputation risk. There's also significant health policy regarding PAD and lower extremity amputation prevention uh, with uh, the ARC Act currently going through Congress to prevent amputations, and this should make it easier for patients to get appropriate testing and treatment to prevent amputations into the future. So if PAD is this important, why haven't I heard of it before? Well, you're not alone. Uh, PAD is under-recognized by patients and healthcare teams. Compared to coronary heart disease, PAD is less frequently recognized by both doctors and patients. And that's primarily because PAD symptoms can be absent or atypical, and the link between heart attack and stroke is often less familiar relative to the risk uh, for folks who have coronary heart disease or carotid artery disease. Well, hopefully after our discussion so far today, you feel more confident and familiar with PAD. But one of the questions is, how familiar is the community with this problem? Unfortunately, it's not great. PAD awareness is quite low, and this was shown in a study done by the University of Minnesota some years ago now, where they called 2,500 community members and asked them about their familiarity with chronic conditions, including high blood pressure, all the way to PAD. And what we found in this study is that patients who reported to be very familiar or somewhat familiar with uh, chronic conditions, uh, there was a wide range of familiarity. Patients with, uh, were more familiar with high blood pressure or stroke, and unfortunately, PAD was uh, much lower. In fact, 
patients were less familiar with PAD than they were with cystic fibrosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, which are pretty rare conditions relative to PAD. How is PAD diagnosed? Well, we start with a clinical history and physical exam, but many times it's about patient suspicion that they may have a problem. Vascular testing is, of course, the uh, way to confirm the diagnosis of PAD. There is a spectrum of lower extremity PAD that ranges from asymptomatic all the way to patients who have foot wounds and gangrene and everywhere in the middle. But the ankle brachial index is the primary diagnostic test we start with most of the time. And this is a basic test to diagnose PAD by measuring the blood pressures in all four extremities and comparing the ratio of blood pressures in the ankles to the arms. And this gives us an index of blood pressures that is diagnostic for peripheral artery disease. How do we prevent PAD? Well, it starts with a healthy lifestyle, and getting, including getting plenty of activity, not using tobacco products, and controlling high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. Let's focus on the third fact I'd like you to know, that PAD is treatable. This is the good news. The good news is, is that we can not only lower cardiovascular risk, but also treat the condition. But I'd like to just take a moment and talk about managing chronic disease in general. We're aware that average patient spends about 15 minutes in the office per year and poverty, social exclusion, and depression limit access to care in many patients and no other population more so than those with peripheral artery disease given the associations with other medical problems including diabetes and tobacco use and the fact that PAD tends to affect our minority communities. That limited access to care strongly influences health outcomes and is something we're committed to helping neutralize in our health system. In general, the physical health of chronic disease in the, in the U.S., PAD ranks near the bottom. This is a, a graph showing the percent of the U.S. population represented on the upward axis and on the longitudinal axis showing from worst health to best health how we uh, as a population do. Hopefully most of us are towards the right of the screen here where the average adult is in pretty good health and we, we uh, are representative of most of the population. But patients with PAD join heart failure and COPD as uh, being in the worst health and uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind because these patients often have other health conditions that lead them not to seek care. We also um, have problems with undertreatment of peripheral artery disease to lower cardiovascular risk. It's important to keep in mind that proper medical treatment can reduce cardiovascular risk by about 35%. But medications like statins and uh, blood pressure medications, antiplatelet medications like aspirin, exercise and diet counseling and tobacco counseling don't happen as often as they ought to lower that cardiovascular risk. If you have PAD and you're not on these treatments or need to know more about these treatments, you should talk to your doctor because these are very important treatments to help lower your cardiovascular risk. We also use supervised exercise therapy to treat the symptoms of PAD. And this is exercise prescribed to improve the endurance and mobility of patients who might suffer from claudication or leg pain when they walk. Supervised exercise therapy also improves heart and vascular health in general. And in many cases, it's the only treatment needed to treat the symptoms of peripheral artery disease for patients who don't have foot ulcers or foot wounds. Medicare now covers supervised exercise therapy for peripheral artery disease. Uh, so patients who qualify for this testing must have symptoms of claudication and they participate in structured exercise sessions lasting from 30 to 60 minutes three times a week over 12 weeks. These sessions must be supervised by a qualified health professional with exercise targeting claudication symptoms, often with treadmill or track walking. Medicare service providers do have the discretion to cover an additional 36 sessions of uh, supervised exercise therapy for patients um, if they continue to have symptoms. The cost of this exercise training is about $55 per session. Most of that is covered by Medicare. About $11 per session is, recovered, is covered by the patients, however. Um, these sessions not only benefit the uh, patients with PAD as far as their leg symptoms, but also a community of benefits to patients, including incorporating healthy um, lifestyle habits, um, helping folks with um, smoking cessation, diet counseling, monitoring, including monitoring of blood pressures and other benefits that my patients with peripheral artery disease who participate in supervised exercise therapy enjoy. Solostazole or Pletel is the only FDA approved medical treatment that's been shown to improve symptoms of claudication. 
unfortunately, salostazole in about a third of patients can be associated with side effects, including GI upset, diarrhea, headaches, or palpitations. So it's usually not a medication we start immediately, um, and usually not before we trial exercise therapy. Shared decision-making in peripheral artery disease is a really important component of treating this chronic condition. Returning for follow-up to ensure fitness level and th that patients are meeting their quality of life goals is very important. And this enhances engagement between the doctor and patient in chronic PAD care to look for opportunities where we can lower your cardiovascular risk and improve your uh, symptoms of PAD. In our health system, we use the peripheral artery questionnaire to measure how good your quality of life is if you have PAD. And this is a 20-point questionnaire developed by the Mid-America Heart Institute and basically shows an estimate of your overall PAD-related um, quality of life. And from a scale of 0 to 100, which represents worst to best health, we can use that to follow patients over time. And when patients are doing well, um, that's fantastic. But when folks are not doing well, we can use that to intervene and try to improve quality of life. Assessing PAD-related quality of life is an important part of our treatment here at St. Luke's using the PAC survey, which can be conveniently uh, completed either through an office visit or through the patient portal on my chart. And this really, to my patients, demonstrates um, true treatment benefits. When we make a plan and we see their health status improve over time, that's gratifying to both the patient and myself that we're on the right track. But it also helps us to reveal when more treatment may be needed, and fixing the arteries with balloons, stents, or bypass should be used in patients who are not achieving quality of life goals and relief of claudication. And again, Dr. Vamanan is going to cover more of those topics later. I'd like to share with you a couple patient stories that I think exemplify how we treat peripheral artery disease in the St. Luke's Health System. And I have two patient stories that I'd like to share with you, and these patients have shared their stories previously. Um, on the left, we have Harold, and Harold came to me with very severe peripheral artery disease after uh, being treated locally here and then going to the Mayo Clinic, as well as in Cleveland. And Harold's issues were very serious regarding his PAD, but through uh, a coordinated program and uh, multidisciplinary care, we were able to get Harold the treatment he needed to uh, save both of his legs when he was told um, elsewhere that he probably needed an amputation. Chris on the right was a much younger patient who presented with somewhat atypical symptoms of uh, leg pain. We diagnosed Chris with PAD using an ankle brachial index and over the course of the year made some improvement in his lifestyle and quality of life with a walking program. After about a year or so, Chris needed more help uh, because he wasn't achieving his quality of life goals and so we offered Chris uh, treatment of his peripheral artery disease that significantly improved his quality of life. And he was very thankful for that and he's now able to enjoy his family much more and uh, participate in, in daily activities without being limited by his PAD. So let's summarize the facts I hope you take away about peripheral artery disease. Fact one, PAD is common. We know that rates of diabetes and an aging population, PAD is here to stay. And so it's important for you to know that it exists and it could impact your health. PAD is serious. It is not just about causing leg pain, but also about the associated cardiovascular risk and the treatments medical therapy can offer to lower that cardiovascular risk. And then lastly, fact number three I hope you take away is that PAD is treatable. And this is the good news about PAD. Not only can we improve symptoms of claudication or leg pain or for patients with very severe limb-threatening problems associated with PAD, but we can also lower heart risk and vascular risk, and those treatments are just as important. So talk to your doctor to know more about PAD treatment if you have questions. And uh, speaking of questions, if you'd like to know more about peripheral artery disease or you have more questions in general, our website is a great resource uh, for both PAD as well as other conditions that um, associ are associated with the vascular system. So I'd encourage you to check out our website to learn more. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today about peripheral artery disease. If you have questions, please feel free to drop those in the question box. Once we uh, accumulate all of those questions and answer those, we'll send those out in an email to follow this presentation. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for signing up for this uh, educational event, and thanks for being here th this morning. 
I am Karthik Vamanan. I am the uh, co-director of the uh, St. Luke's Hospital Vascular Center. I'm an associate professor of surgery at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And uh, you listened to a presentation by Dr. Bunty just a little while ago talking about PAD and the, the causes of PAD and the diagnosis of PAD. And he also talked a little bit about the treatment, but I'm going to finish the topic of PAD by discussing the treatment of PAD with you. So let's move on. I'm going to start off with what I think should be the most important takeaway message for today. If you're going to get anything out of this presentation, it should be this. It's not infrequent for me to see a patient in my office that comes in with a diagnosis of a blocked artery. And all they care about is the blocked artery. It tends to panic people, and they want to come in and get it fixed immediately. The bottom line is that PAD does not have to be treated. We only treat PAD if it is causing problems. The reason we like to identify patients with PAD is because identifying them helps us modify their risk factors, and this overall helps improve their cardiovascular health and essentially their mortality. Because PAD is the same disease process that affects arteries, that also affects the arteries in your heart, your carotid arteries, and those arteries are responsible for what is the biggest cause of death, which is strokes and heart attacks. So there's actually a spectrum of patients with PAD. Dr. Bunty discussed this in his presentation as well. And I'm going to break it down into slightly simpler language to where we're going to bring it down to the requirement and the supply of oxygen. As you know, arteries bring the blood out to various parts of your body, and they are hence responsible for supplying oxygen to various parts of your body. So you could be diagnosed with PAD and have some blocked arteries without really experiencing a decrease in the supply of oxygen. And we'll go over how that happens in a little while. But you could have a diagnosis of PAD and remain asymptomatic or have no symptoms at all. Now, if the supply in oxygen reduces a little bit to where you don't have any problems when you're not doing anything, when you're at rest, you have enough oxygen supplied to your body that it doesn't bother you. But when you want to increase that supply of oxygen, like when you're exercising or walking or doing anything that needs more oxygen, your arteries could be blocked to a level where they are, they're not able to supply that oxygen. And then you would have pain, because usually when you don't have oxygen, you have pain. So that comes down to the next severity of PAD, which essentially means that you're normal when you're at rest, but when you exercise, you have some pain because your oxygen supply is limited to a certain degree. If you get one further step down that spectrum, you don't have enough oxygen to supply your body even when you are at rest. So you have parts of your body that are beyond blocked arteries that are blocked badly enough that they don't get enough oxygen down there even when you're not doing anything. And that's when you start having pain when you're not doing anything. And that also tells us that at that point, your tissues are not getting enough oxygen to survive. And that if we don't do anything, you will probably lose that part of your body. And that's what we call chronic limb-threatening ischemia because at this point, that part of your body is threatened because it does not get enough oxygen. So before we start talking about treating patients with PAD, we need some testing. And the most important part of that testing is non-invasive testing. So what I mean by that is these tests are in not invasive. And what they do is they quantify blood flow. It's as simple as getting a blood pressure. So if I get a blood pressure somewhere, it tells me how much blood's getting down there. So I actually stole this slide right out of Dr. Bunty's presentation. I'm sure you folks saw it in the earlier presentation. And uh, one of the most basic tests to diagnose PAD is an ankle brachial index. So we check a blood pressure in your arm. We check a blood pressure in your ankle. And if you don't have blocked arteries, they should be the same. But if you have blocked arteries, you can tell that the pressure where the artery is blocked is going to be lower than where it's not blocked. So we'll notice a decrease in the blood pressure in your ankle or if maybe in your arm. Wherever the artery is blocked, the pressure is going to be lower. So this is one of the most basic tests. It kind of tells us that you have a blocked artery, and it also tells us how much blood is getting down there. So when we get an ABI, it kind of this is kind of what the report looks like. You can tell that. This patient has 
from the schematic multiple blood pressure cuffs on his legs. Uh, we put them at four different levels. We check the pressures at all these levels. And when there's a fall in pressure, we know that that area or the area between those two blood pressure cuffs is blocked. So this, when we get tests like this, gives us a good estimate to where the blocks are and it also tells us how much blood is actually getting down to the foot and down to the toes so we know how to manage and treat these people. This is essentially a stress test so it is very similar to the stress test that we do for the hearts but this is actually for your legs. We put people on a treadmill and we check their blood pressures after they walk and you can see the green line there there is a significant drop in the blood pressure after the patient walks a little bit and that tells us that when the patient needs more oxygen or needs more blood, that artery going down to that leg is not able to supply that blood, so there's a significant drop in the pressure there. Once we've completed our non-invasive testing and we've quantified the amount of blood that gets down to your legs or to your hands sometimes, we then go for what are called anatomic studies or more extensive or invasive investigations where we actually look at the anatomy of your blood supply. So we would look at a CT scan or an MRI, or sometimes we put catheters in your arteries and shoot some contrast down the arteries while we're looking at them under x-ray, and that tells us where the blocks are, gives us an idea as to how we can treat those blocks, and helps kind of tailor, tailor treatments uh, based on your need. That being said, we'll move on to how we actually treat PAD. The simplest non-invasive way of treating PAD is with a balloon. So angioplasty balloons have been around for many years, uh, I'd say over 50 years now, and the way we use them is we put a wire across the area that's blocked, and then we follow that with a catheter that has a balloon on it, and once the catheter gets where, where, where it needs to go, we inflate the balloon, and we open that artery up to whatever size it needs to be. And I'm going to show you a picture here of a simple case. Uh, on the first panel there on the left, you'll see an angiogram, and you'll see we're shooting dye down the patient's leg. That's their foot. And you can see right above the ankle, the artery on the left is blocked. And you can see it's a small area that's blocked. And on the second panel, you'll see there's a picture of uh, me having pushed a wire across that area that's blocked. That line you see through there, through the arteries that have contrast going through, is actually a wire. And in the third panel, you'll see that's the video that's playing now. You'll see that we've opened that area up with a balloon, and you can tell that the contrast is going right through that artery, and that artery is being opened up. So this is a simple way. It's very non-invasive. We go in with a wire and a balloon. We're able to inflate that balloon in the area that's blocked and get that artery open. This patient had a toe that had an ulcer on it from not getting enough oxygen. And after I did this, the patient has healed his toe subsequently. Even though the original balloons have been around for a long time, we have since developed a lot of other balloons that help keep the artery open. So we have balloons that have a chemotherapeutic agent on them that helps prevent scar formation in the area that we angioplastied. We also have balloons with knives on them that helps us inflate the artery and open the artery with lower pressure because it cuts the plaque. And we have balloons that emit shock waves or ultrasound waves that break up plaque that's very calcified in arteries, and this could be anywhere from your heart all the way down to your feet. The next step up is stents. So sometimes we can put stents in arteries, and stents are actually metal lattices that help keep arteries open. And if you think about it logically, you can't put stents in any place where the artery moves or bends because it is actually a piece of metal. We also use stents to treat aneurysms. Sometimes we use stents to put across areas of injury where the artery is bleeding. And I'm going to show you a couple of different kinds of stents there. On the top left panel, you see a stent that's covered with fabric. That stent is waterproof. Blood won't come through that fabric. So we can put it across an area where an artery has a hole, if you think about it. And no blood should come through there. So we could fix in arterial injuries with that stent. And on the lower right frame, you'll see a standard stent that is not covered with fabric. And we use that stent to open arteries up. And as you can see, that stent, or both stents are fairly flexible. So here's a video of a patient, and we're looking at the patient's abdomen here, and uh, you can see on the right frame that bright white dots are actually a stent that the patient already has in the artery that's on the left facing you. And on the right, you can see that the main artery coming down to the patient's leg is blocked. It's nearly completely blocked. 
So, like I discussed before, the first thing we have to do is get a wire across the area that's blocked. And you can see there that we have first had to go in a different direction. We first had to go downwards to get that artery partially open. And then we managed to get a wire going upwards. And then we actually used a shockwave balloon here because if you can't tell, that plaque that's blocking that artery that's on the right facing you is very calcified or very hard. We had to use a shockwave balloon to break up that calcium. And the the video that's playing now on the right is what it looks like after the balloon. And then we finally put a stent in there, and that's the finished product. So we managed to get that artery open with a combination of balloons and stents. Stents work fairly well in the aorta, which is your big artery that brings the blood out of your heart. It kind of ends around your belly button, and then it splits into the two arteries that supply your legs. These arteries don't move, and stents work very well in this area. If we can get them open with a stent, they usually stay open for a long time. And here's another patient who came in with blocked arteries, and you can see the artery on the right is nearly completely blocked. The aorta is at the very top of the screen, and if you look there, there is a white spot that's moving around in that picture, and that is actually a blood clot that's sitting in the aorta. And uh, we managed to get this patient opened up with a stent that went all the way up into the aorta, and you can see now he has good blood flow into both his lower extremities there on the right. So this is an example of us using a covered stent or a stent that has a fabric coating, and what that helps us do is keep that clot out of the circulation, and the blood now comes through the stent that's covered. Sometimes stents don't work. If your arteries are blocked around your groins, or if your arteries are blocked around your knees, where the artery bends and moves a lot, or around your shoulders, you cannot put a stent there because the stent over time will get crushed and will stop working. So in these cases, we need to make what is called a bypass. And a bypass is the same, everybody's heard about heart bypasses, but we also do heart bypasses anywhere. We can do a bypass in the neck, we can do bypasses in the legs, in the arms. And what we essentially do is we take a tube, and this tube could be your own vein, it could be something that's artificial, it could be vein from a cadaver or a deceased donor that has donated their veins, and we use these veins to create a bypass around the area that's blocked. And that's exactly what it sounds like. We hook up the tube, in the artery that's open closer to the heart, and then we hook it up in an artery that's open around the block, and then this blood just flows through this tube around the blocked artery. And I'll show you an example here of a patient that actually needed a combination of things. So you can, this is the aorta again on the left, and you can see in the video that the patient has significant blocked arteries up in the abdomen. And this patient, you now look at the video on the left, we put a stent in that artery that was blocked. It's just a magnified view of the same artery that's on the right in the first screen. And then this is the rest of the patient's anatomy. And you can see here that he had blocked arteries going all the way down to his knee, and they were finally open down in his leg. And this is a finished picture of the patient's leg after we operated on him. There's multiple incisions on that leg, and we used his own vein. We took the vein out using those little incisions on his thigh, and we hooked it up in the groin where the artery was open, and we hooked it up again below the knee where that artery was open hence making a bypass around the block that was the entire artery in the thigh. This patient also did pretty well and uh, has since left the hospital, healed his foot completely. Sometimes patients are not a candidate for a bypass, and this happens when there is no artery that you can hook up into on the far side. So you can hook it up close to you where the artery is open, but there's nothing open away from you where you can hook a bypass into. And I'm going to show you some new methods we've developed of trying to treat these patients. And what we essentially do here is a technique called deep vein arterialization. And we make the veins in your body an artery. Veins are traditionally meant to bring the blood back towards your heart. But in this case, we convert the veins into kind of arteries by hooking them into an artery and sending the blood in the opposite direction to the way it's supposed to go in the vein. To show you here an example of a patient that could not have a bypass on the first screen, you'll see the, the video on the left shows that his arteries are open. That's an artery that's close to his knee and that's open going down into his leg. On the second video that's playing, you'll see an artery that continues down his leg. And on the third panel, you'll see that when we get down to his foot, there is no real artery that we can hook a bypass into. And all those little arteries you see on that screen are all what we call collaterals. And that's the natural response of a body to blocked arteries. It forms pathways around the blocks and helps get blood down there. Albeit, this patient had 
a toe that was starting to die and we had to do something to save his foot. So because he had no option for a bypass, I took his vein and I hooked it up into his artery by the knee and you can see here that that's a vein. On the previous picture we didn't notice that but if you look around the heel there on the right hand side of the frame you'll see that the arteries are open there but this big line that f of black contrast that comes through the middle is actually the patient's vein and we've managed to get some blood down into his foot and you can see here after ballooning the vein a little bit and tying off a couple of branches you can see here now that that vein is bringing blood into the foot. This is the same foot that just a minute ago we saw had absolutely no blood vessels in it. But you can see here now that this vein, the flow in the vein has been reversed and the patient is now getting blood flow through his veins into the foot. And you see that little lattice work of fine blood vessels right in the middle of that screen that show up late. That's essentially the small veins that are now starting to supply the foot. So this is a new technique that we use in patients that cannot have a bypass by reversing the direction of flow in their veins. That being said, I think I've covered most of the ways in which we treat PAD. Um, PAD also, like I reiterated earlier, does not have to be treated. Just because you have a diagnosis of PAD, it does not have to be treated. If you do need to be treated, we have multiple ways of treating it. We only treat PAD if it is causing problems. Identifying patients with PAD helps us modify their risk factors and improve their overall cardiovascular health and mortality. And at St. Luke's, we have a true multidisciplinary clinic that involves all three specialties that treat vascular disease. And we have a truly multidisciplinary practice to where you can come in and get the best treatments that is tailored to you and hopefully have the best outcome. Thank you all again for being here today, this morning and spending time with us. Uh, please feel free to send us any questions you have and you should be supplied our number at the end of this presentation and hopefully you can give us a call if you need us. Thanks.